And so I felt that psychedelics, my initial LSD experience, opened me up to feelings. And it also had me ask some questions like, who am I? Where do I fit into this big picture? And I thought, this is what my bar mitzvah should have been. So what was my life like before I experienced psychedelics? You know, so I was born in 53. I experienced psychedelics um, at age 17 in college. Before that, I actually, for most of that period of time, had believed the propaganda against psychedelics. And I believed that if you took LSD more than, uh, I think it was six times, you were certifiably insane. I believed that um, LSD would scramble your chromosomes. Um, I believe that these were all hallucinations and delusions that were produced by psychedelics. I remember being very political and I was really educated from a very early age on stories of the Holocaust and, you know, distant relatives killed. And that was kind of the theme of my life, trying to grapple with that and understand that. My dad was a doctor. My mother was a teacher. My family was well off. I'm white. I'm Jewish as chosen people. A male, I was the firstborn male child, the firstborn child to my parents. So basically I had every conceivable uh, advantage that you could think of to assume that I could impact the world. Then I was horrified at the world, but I was very much then secondarily traumatized by the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a young boy in school taught to uh, duck and cover under our desk. And that made me really further frightened about the annihilation of the whole world. And then I'd say the final step was my own country uh, getting involved in Vietnam, and I was in one of the last years of the lottery. I was uh, radicalized by that. And all of that made me really think, how do I respond to this uh, murderous nature of the human psyche? So I, I'd say that my life before experiencing psychedelics was meaningfully engaged with the external world and with politics, but not very meaningfully engaged with my inner world. And I was very immature emotionally. I think that's another important thing to say that I was reading books all the time, very shy. I could hardly talk to girls at all. And I had been uh, tremendously disappointed by my bar mitzvah, which had um, been shared to me by my parents and community that this was gonna be a powerful rites of passage and none of that happened. So I just had this deep inner emptiness. You could say that I was kind of primed for psychedelics. <laughs> and so as I looked at what had happened in the 60s, my sense of it was that something about the psychedelic experience had helped people see outside of the framework of their own life, their own ego and connected them with the larger world. My, my curiosity though is, is what is it about this experience that seems to have motivated an entire generation to talk about peace and love and to protest the Vietnam War and get involved in other social justice issues? I couldn't quite understand it from what I had read and I knew that experiencing it might be the only way to really get an understanding. Yeah, well, the, the first time that I was exposed to the idea that psychedelics could be used in a meaningful way was in my Russian class in my senior year, a friend of mine gave me a book to read. And when I handed it back to him, he said, do you realize that the author of this book wrote some of it while he was under the influence of LSD? And my response was, that's impossible. You know, LSD is a delusion, it's a hallucination, nothing good comes from it. And I checked into it and actually it turned out that he was right. And it was uh, Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I thought if something so profound of a piece of literature could have been produced in part while the author was on LSD, then what I had been told about LSD was not true. And so that was the first crack in the edifice of the anti-drug propaganda that I had absorbed. There's a lot more to this and maybe I should consider trying it. What can I share about a very impactful journey that I had and how did I prepare for it and what happened and what were the consequences of that? My early experiences were with synthetic mescaline and also with LSD. There was also a fair amount of cow pastures not far from where I went to college. So there was some psilocybin mushrooms as well. So I've had well over a hundred experiences sort of with those classic psychedelics. And so I got invited to these meetings at Esalen the story that I'm about to tell, that's all sort of prelude introduction to uh, 
two experiences that took place at Esalen in 84. It's back-to-back experiences, two days in a row. The first one was with uh, DMT, and the second one was with ketamine. So this was with Terrence McKenna and Ralph Metzner and um, a few other people, about eight of us. Um, and it gathered in a room in the evening at Esalen, and we were going to try DMT, which I had never tried before. And the way that we were doing it was pretty great. It was, uh, you know, DMT, when you smoke it, it's 10 or 15 minutes, and then you sort of come back. And so we would have um, one person would smoke it and sort of lie back down after they smoked it. And uh, the rest of the people would sort of hold space for them, occasionally talk. And then they come back, and then they kind of shared what had happened to them. And then we talked about it a bit, and then the pipe got passed to the next person. So this was like a whole evening of multiple, multiple hours. Uh, When it came to be my turn to try the DMT, I was um, taken aback by how fast the experience was. And so the way I'll describe what happened to me is that after I smoked a couple of puffs on this pipe, I saw with my eyes closed, I saw a horizontal line. And then I saw a vertical line, kind of like this. And then it, it turned a color, it turned red. And then it started forming into cubes, three-dimensional. And then it turned into like an M.C. Escher painting where it just no longer makes sense anymore. And then I was blasted out of, you know, my normal way of thinking, you know. Um, and, And then I had this thought that in the most private part of my brain where I'm talking to myself, you know, this sort of inner voice that we all have, But then I realized that I was speaking to myself in a language, English, that I had not invented. And in fact, millions of people had sort of contributed to the development of this language. And so even though this was my innermost private space, it was filled with this connection with millions and millions of people that have gone before. And then I felt that that was part of not just these um, this historical English speakers, but uh, but even every part of my body had been evolved. And I, I just felt like then I was part of this vast universe, uh, you know. So I'm thinking all of that, and I'm thinking how beautiful it is that I'm part of everything and that there's been this incredible evolution. And But then I had this very disturbing thought that kind of sunk me like a stone. And the thought was that if I'm part of everything and everything is part of me, then Hitler is also a part of me. He's not just the outside embodiment of evil, which is what I grew grew up believing. You know, I was a good person. This evil was all out there. And that thought was just so logically true, but so emotionally devastating that it just um, shook me. And so when I came back from my experience and to share that with the other people, you know, I was kind of shaking and I was um, feeling very disturbed um, and it was difficult to to share and difficult to sit with. And it it was good because here we were also going to try to battle with the DEA that was going to try to criminalize MDMA, which had enormous therapeutic potential. And so if I had demonized the DEA, that they're all bad and I'm all good. You know, it would have been difficult for me to um, approach some of these DEA people as humans and try to find ways to communicate with them. So as I was still struggling with that in order to try to integrate that, um, the very next night um, we had an opportunity and then people decided to do ketamine. The way in which we did that, again, was a group of people, you know, lying down. We all tried to do the ketamine at the same time more or less, so that then when we came back, you know, we could kind of talk about it. We didn't do it one by one the way that we did it the night before. So under the influence of ketamine, I was very, uh, not completely surprised, but sh- but um, very terrified to have been transmitted to a situation where Hitler was giving a speech, like the Nuremberg rallies, something like that, where, where there's, you know, he's ranting and raving and there's 100,000 people and And so I was hovering above and behind him. So the ketamine is called a dissociative anesthetic. So it gave me this sense that I was there, but not there. And I was having to think about how do I get in his head so that he would not want to kill 
so many people. And so while I'm thinking that, I'm getting more and more panicked, more and more frightened. And so I had this idea that if I take deep breaths, I might be able to not be overwhelmed with fear. So I did start breathing and that did help me. And then I was able to more clearly take a look at what was going on with Hitler and this rally. And I had never thought about it before in this way, but I saw him do the Heil Hitler salute. Then I saw everybody else um, doing it back to him. And then he would do it again. And then they would all do it back to him. And I got this sense of this um, energy ball almost, that he was pushing it out to them, this Heil Hitler salute. And then it would be from the one to the many. And they would concentrate all their energy and push it back to him and sort of give away their power to him. And then he would do it back and they would do it back and forth. And the more that they got in sync with this kind of yeah leader follower, kind of one pointed attention, it, it felt like the frequency was increasing, increasing. And, the, and I came to the conclusion that there was no way that I could get into his head. I don't think there was any way that Anybody could have a conversation with him that I could have a conversation or something that would help him overcome these kind of murderous, psychopathic, uh, sadistic aspects of his personality. But that was very depressing, that initial understanding. But then, and out of that came what I would say is the fundamental political approach of maps, which is the irony that it's actually will be easier then changing one person's mind who doesn't want to change, it will actually be easier to change millions of people's minds who are giving away their power to this one person. There will always be these dictators. There will always be these psychopaths. There will always be them. We can never stop them. But what we can do is we can ground a sort of spiritualized humanity, a mass mental health, so that people are not so willing to give away their power. And I'd say this sense of this uh, two experiences initially with um, DMT and then with ketamine really reinforced this idea that um, it's not about the elite people getting enlightened, that really what's going to be necessary is the, the whole mass of humanity moving in a more psychologically healthy way. And so I, when I think back on which of my psychedelic experiences in my lives have been the most important. There, there's other ones that have been critically important in different ways. This sequence of two experiences has really, I'd say, solidified the, the political and the strategic approach that MAPS has been undertaking for the last 36 years. Yeah, what, what, so how did I integrate this experience? What, what did integration look like? To, to give you an example, I guess, of how I felt that I integrated it, is that when I did start um, going to these hearings and meeting the DEA people that are trying to crush this beautiful thing, this uh, legal use of MDMA, I was able to not see them as totally evil. And I was able to develop some good relationships with some of them, even acknowledging we're on the different side of different things. But in particular, there was one person, Frank Sapienza from the DEA, who was the representative of the DEA at these different hearings. And so I spent the most time with him. And during that, um, he was willing to share that they had, uh, the DEA had no knowledge about therapeutic use of MDMA. They just thought they were crushing ecstasy. So just recently now, um, there's a, a woman, um, Rachel Neuer, who's written some articles for the New York Times, and she's writing a book about MDMA. And so she wanted to see about interviewing some of the early DEA people that were involved in the criminalization for her book. And I said, that's a great idea. Let, let me just see. And I thought, oh, maybe Frank Sapienza is still alive. He'd be the next best person. And so I did a Google search on him and then immediately discovered uh, on his LinkedIn page that he was still alive. And not only that, but he had left the DEA, but he was running a consulting company to help pharma companies who want to reschedule their drugs once they're made into a medicine. I hadn't talked to him in about 35 years. So I decided though that I would send him a message on LinkedIn. And I said, um, you know, I'm Rick, you might remember me from these DEA hearings. And then, and said, um, you know, you, you weren't really trying to squash the therapeutic use of MDMA. And now after all these years, we are making an enormous amount of progress. And 
we think that uh, we may need to reschedule MDMA. Would you be willing to work with our team as an expert to help us reschedule? I didn't know that he would even be looking at his LinkedIn page or anything, but the very next day, he wrote me back and he said, I remember you, I remember you well, thank you for that quote. Um, I will be willing to help you. And Frank has now joined the team to help about rescheduling MDMA. So when you ask, how did I integrate that experience? That's the best example that I can give, that, that I was able to kind of have this human relationship with Frank that I didn't demonize him, so therefore he didn't demonize me. And we were able then to have some good conversations that uh, you know, basically 36 years later, now he's willing to help us reschedule MDMA to make it into a medicine. Yeah, can I describe the overall, overall impact that uh, psychedelics have had on my life? Also, when I was thinking about what experience to talk about, um, I was going back to my very first LSD experience. And the, the main thing that it did for me was I, I was just so utterly in my mind. I, you know, I was, like I said, scared of talking to girls. And the first LSD experience that I had created a, a sense of crisis in a way as your ego is dissolving. And I had experiences of fear, of panic, but they were emotions. And so I felt that psychedelics, my initial LSD experience, opened me up to feelings. And it also had me ask some questions like, who am I? Where do I fit into this big picture? And I thought, this is what my bar mitzvah should have been, helping me ask these existential questions, helping me get in touch with my feelings, becoming a more well-rounded person, and also gave me this intimation of a spiritual connection that has had this sense. So I've just been a battling with cancer uh, I wouldn't say it's even a real bad battle. It was you know, prostate cancer caught early and I just had my prostate removed. And But this idea that when you connect with something beyond your, your ego and your sort of birth and death trajectory and you see your part of something much bigger, it changes your attitude towards death. So during this whole process with cancer, it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm terrified of dying. Or, you know, it's more like, how do I use my time well? And I think it also helped me to realize that this concept of a spiritualized humanity um, is not just an idealistic dream that could never happen. You know, and as I was first doing psychedelics, what I want to also just share is that in the background was um, the U.S. trying to go to the moon and actually landing on the moon. So... The whole of humanity is sort of going through this kind of process of, of reaching to the moon, of, of seeing the earth from space, of seeing how we are part of one thing, not from psychedelics, but through science and through this just understanding of the world, that that is kind of mirroring what a lot of people have experienced in psychedelic states, and it kind of reaffirms it. So it, it helped me, I think, fundamentally to realize that this transformation of who we think we are. There, there was one moment at Esalen, um, and this was uh, actually um, later in the 90s, but I, I was just at the edge of the cliff and there was a um, fence there so you don't fall off the cliff. And I just had this thought, what would it be like if my life wasn't centered on psychedelics? And, and I felt this vortex of uncertainty like pulling me over the edge of the cliff. Like I would, I would be lost. I would be completely lost if I had no anchor in psychedelics. Now I would have figured out something else. I, you know, who knows? But uh, I just felt like that this was such a core aspect of who I had become ever since I was eighteen that um, I, I don't know who I would be without it. So what that sort of finally sums up is that psychedelics have provided me with um, with my own north star. And that has guided my life ever since the very first time I took LSD. And that was 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, what kind of resource would I recommend to somebody starting their journey? I think the resource that was the um, most useful to me, and this may not be as useful to everybody else, but it was Stan Groff's book, Realms of the Human Unconscious observations from LSD research. And just to show you how lucky I was, you know, I went to the guidance counselor at college in 1972 when I was 18 and I said, help me with my psychedelic experiences. 
And, you know, you do that today, the guidance counselor calls the police and kicks you out of school. But at that point, the guy took me seriously and he gave me a copy of this book to read. And um, as it turned out, the book wasn't published for three more years. He had a manuscript copy directly from Stan. Uh, but it was reading that book that discussed what had been learned from LSD research, what that meant in terms of the structure of the unconscious. And it pointed out from a scientific point of view about the validity of this sort of mystical experience of connection. So I, I distrusted religion as a way to be, you know, freighted with uh, unexamined beliefs. And But the scientific approach, I think, was um, critical for me to believe it and then also to see the validity of it. So I think for somebody that's thinking about preparing for a, a psychedelic experience, you know, that's kind of a complex, heady book. Um, th there, there's another video, a documentary that, that I think would be useful for people. It's called Trip of Compassion. And it's about, um, it's the most patient-centered documentary ever made about MDMA. Now, it applies to psilocybin and LSD as well, but it, it's on Vimeo and it, it's about three of our Israeli PTSD patients and uh, the parts that are in Hebrew have English subtitles. A lot of it is in English, but I think it's important to prepare to try to get a sense as to what could happen, the range of things that could happen. And that the main lesson from that is that it's important to welcome whatever is happening, even if it's painful or difficult, and that the suppression of what's emerging is what turns a difficult trip into a bad trip. And I, I had loads of bad trips where I would just, I couldn't handle it. I, that's what drove me to the guidance counselor. So I, I think there's something else that would be useful to people. It's another book. Um, it's called The Secret Chief Revealed. And it's a short book. And it's about Leo Zeff, who was the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement. MAPS has published it. And it's just his discussion of all the different drugs that he uses, what's his kind of therapeutic approach, how do you prepare for a psychedelic experience, um, how do you integrate it. So it's written, he was a clinical psych PhD, but he wasn't a theoretician the way Stan was. He was more of a practical therapist. And so it's, it's an easier book to read. But I think that that would be really good preparation for people. And then the final thing that I would say is that if you can find people that have had experiences, talk to them and, and see what they say, because you will learn a lot from other people. And then the, I guess that isn't the final thing I'll say. The other thing I'll, I'll say is that because of prohibition, people have to beware because you know there have people died from taking ecstasy laced with fentanyl it's a difficult thing to get pure drugs and so i think be wary of whatever it is you're going to try and try to make sure that it is what it what you think it is that, that's why i think there's a lot of value in mushrooms you look at the mushrooms and people can yeah it's unlikely people are going to put new things into the mushrooms there is one dea licensed lab in the country in the us that does drug checking for anonymous samples it's called drug detection lab it's in Sacramento. Um, the uh, Arrowhead has an uh, ecstasy pill testing program. Finally, my third, second final thing um, is uh, to pay attention to your dreams and to realize that the dreams are another way to continue the either the emotional content or even sometimes the subjective content of a psychedelic experience. Um, so I think if you're going to be preparing for a psychedelic experience, it's really good to start preparing to remember your dreams. But but I do think that um, people have this natural process going on. And if you just connect to your own dreams, that will be a real good anchoring process as you move into a psychedelic experience. <laughs>